Hello everyone, my name is John Belitis. I'm an attorney and partner with the law firm of Fenimore Craig in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, with my partner, Lori Higuera, we're here to talk to you today about social media issues in the workplace. My practice has focused uh, for the past 25 years or so here at Fenimore Craig on management side employment law. And uh, this particular topic, uh, social media, its effects and risks in the workplace has become very popular over the past couple of years. And uh, it's an important topic for employers to pay attention to, as you'll see as we go through the presentation. Um, what we're going to cover today is a wide variety of topics relating to social media in the workplace. Um, I'm actually going to cover uh, half of the issues for you today. And then after a brief break in the middle, uh, Lori Higuera, my partner, will come back and cover the rest of the topics. Uh, what you're looking at now is a slide that really summarizes what we're going to talk about. I want to uh, talk about the slide so that you have an idea uh, of where we're going and what we're going to cover. And then we'll get right into the, ma into the material. Uh, probably the most important aspect of today's topic, uh, and what we'll cover first, is the Nap National Labor Relations Act. Uh, we'll describe this in more detail in a few minutes, but uh, just for introductory purposes, this is a federal law that was passed in the 1930s when um, uh, really the environment was such in the business sector that people thought that the employer really had the upper hand in the employee-employment relationship. And the law was passed by Congress back in this era really to even the playing field between employers and employees. Uh, so we're going to talk a good bit about the NLRA and the National Labor Relations Board, which was created at the same time to administer and enforce the National Labor Relations Act. And as you'll see as we go through the material, this federal law is a very important law when it comes to uh, looking at the topic of social media in the workplace. We'll also talk uh, in connection with the National Labor Relations Act about the concept of protected concerted activity in today's workplace. Um, we will define that during the course of the presentation and, and you will see how this concept is very important as it's presented in the National Labor Relations Act. We're also going to discuss how the National Labor Relations Act impacts employer policies, uh, personnel policies, employee discipline, um, and similar topics in connection with social media in the workplace. We will go through some uh, case law for illustrative purposes uh, to kind of give you examples of how the National Labor Relations Act impacts this area and to make it hopefully easier for you to understand by using some real life examples. Uh, after the break, Lori is going to talk about uh, ownership issues relating to social media accounts and platforms. So that's going to be part of the area that she discusses. Um, this is an area that sort of departs from uh, the National Labor Relations Act in that it really focuses more on who owns uh, social media platforms, accounts, friends, followers, when employees at work are charged with the responsibility of using social media uh, in order to um, uh, promote and improve an employer's business. Um, as Lori will discuss and describe, uh, employers can get into some very <clears throat> um, awkward situations with workers when they depart if they've been charged with the responsibility of using social media to promote a business. Disputes sometimes can arise about who, who owns those accounts and followers and friends. And it's important, I think, to focus on this as an employer so that you hopefully can avoid what can become very costly disputes with departing workers about these issues. Um, and then Lori's also going to discuss social media and, and the issues that arise with social media in the hiring process. Um, how you can and cannot use social media safely as an employer, uh, hopefully to reduce your risk if you're going to use this resource, which is a good resource, but one that you have to use carefully uh, in connection with your hiring practices. So let's, uh, let's move on and talk uh, about the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board and the concept of protected concerted activity. Um, what you're seeing now on, on the slide is a quote from the National Labor Relations Board chairman in uh, 2012 about his belief that the concept uh, of protected concerted activity and an employee's right to engage in it is one of the best kept secrets 
in uh, the National Labor Relations Act and perhaps maybe in, in federal law altogether as it relates to employer-employee relations. And uh, this really has to do primarily with the fact that I think the National Labor Relations Act is sometimes misconceived uh, by employers and employees alike as a law that really pertains more to uh, the union management relationship, union workforces, uh, as opposed to non-unionized workforces. And that is a misconception because um, the aspects of the law that we're going to talk about today in connection with social media apply to employers without regard to whether or not their uh, workforces are unionized. This is a very important point. Uh, as I mentioned when we started, uh, this is a federal law that Congress passed in the 30s. And it, uh, among other things, uh, protects employees' uh, associational and organizational rights. And what that means is it guarantees to employees uh, the right to work together to uh, promote their common good in the workplace. Um, it doesn't apply to all employers. As a general rule, the National Labor Relations Act does not apply to government employers. And it doesn't necessarily cover all workers. For example, the Act does not cover supervisory personnel, and it does not cover independent contractors. Uh, it, it, it only covers private sector employers and those uh, employees who work for those employers who are um, non-supervisory personnel. So the rights that we're going to talk about today uh, in connection with this law and social media uh, really are focused on non-management employees um, in the private sector workforce. Um, I, as I mentioned uh, as well when we started, when Congress passed this law, it created an administrative agency called the National Labor Relations Board. And this agency is charged with the responsibility of um, enforcing and interpreting the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, we refer to the National Labor Relations Board as the NLRB. And the NLRB um, is actually populated by a very small group of appointed individuals in Washington, D.C. who oversee it. But the board has regional offices all across the country. And in these re regional offices, you have administrative law judges as well as lawyers who uh, prosecute uh, alleged violations of the National Labor Relations Act. And so it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting agency because the lawyers who prosecute the claims as well as the judges who hear those claims are all employed by the agency. So I think as you can probably um, uh, conclude, as an employer, uh, you have to be uh, very careful and conscientious in this area because when um, you get in front of a, an administrative law judge at the National Labor Relations Board, um, you, you sort of are stepping into an agency that is um, really geared toward enf enforcing employee rights. It's the nature of the organization, and it's how it was conceived and originally created. Um, uh, when, a, uh, when, a, when a right under the National Labor Relations Act that's afforded to a worker is violated, uh, that worker or former worker uh, will file what we call an unfair labor practice charge with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, this is the, the way in which rights under the Act are uh, brought to the Board's attention and enforced. And when that unfair labor practice charge is filed, it then gets assigned to uh, the appropriate regional office. And if it has merit, uh, a lawyer with the board at that regional office will prosecute that unfair labor practice charge against the employer uh, in front of an administrative law judge uh, who is employed by the board. This is the way these, these violations or alleged violations of the National Labor Relations Act are, are prosecuted and how they progress. These aren't typically claims or um, uh, grievances that are prosecuted in court. They are prosecuted in front of the National Labor Relations Board because the board, like I said, is the agency that was created in connection with the law to enforce it and interpret it. The two primary sections we're going to talk about today in connection with the NLRA are sections 7 and 8. Um, 
Section 7 in the National Labor Relations Act, as you can see on your screen, describes certain rights that are afforded uh, under the law to employees. And the most important aspect of Section 7 for, for our purposes today when we discuss social media really relates to the red uh, boldface language that talks about a worker's right to engage in concerted activities for the purpose of either collective bargaining or, more importantly for today's purposes, other mutual aid or protection. That's the right we're going to focus on today that is afforded under the Act. And then Section 8 um, essentially defines it and makes it uh, an unfair labor practice charge, uh, an unfair labor practice, I should say, um, if an employer interferes with the rights that are described in Section 7. So these two sections work uh, together uh, under the Act uh, for purposes of, of workers and their rights. Section 7 uh, defines workers' rights to engage in protected concerted activity. And Section 8 makes it an unfair labor practice charge for an employer to interfere with that right. So um, we will get into some examples, but just fundamentally to start with, if an employee were to engage in protected concerted activity, as defined in Section 7, and an employer interfered with that activity, then the employee would bring an unfair labor practice charge under Section 8 in front of the National Labor Relations Board. And then that charge would be prosecuted uh, with the board with a decision rendered by an administrative law judge at the board. You should know that the administrative law judges with the board who hear these charges have a uh, wide variety of remedies available in the event they find that an unfair labor practice charge has merit. Um, these administrative law judges can reinstate employees who have been separated. They can um, require employers to change policies um, that employers may have either in a manual or a handbook that the, that the administrative law judge thinks conflicts with the right to engage in protected concerted activity. They can order back pay, front pay, for a worker who has been separated and who has lost wages, for example. So the, uh, uh, the, the complement of remedies available to an administrative law judge when he or she hears an unfair labor practice charge uh, under Section 8 are fairly broad and significant. And all of those remedies could be ordered against an employer uh, if uh, the board, the administrative law judge, concluded that an unfair labor practice charge, uh, an unfair labor practice had in fact occurred uh, under Section 7 and Section 8. So uh, to fall under Section 7, uh, what is protected concerted activity? We've been talking a little bit about that concept and it's important as we move forward through some examples to really define it uh, a little more discreetly. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to read literally what you see on your screen but the, the, the concept is, as you can see, broken down into two components. The activity that Section 7 uh, protects, if you will, is really uh, separated into two concepts. It has to be concerted and it has to be protected. Uh, in order to be concerted activity, the activity really needs to, um, uh, to occur either uh, among coworkers or by a coworker on behalf of others. And in the social media context, this really for the most part uh, occurs in the communication area. Meaning if workers, uh, coworkers communicate with one another in order to advance the common, their common good, um, and it is done in a certain way that we will describe, that activity, that communication among coworkers is protected under Section 7 uh, as concerted activity. Now, um, this, act, this, this type of communication in today's world can take many, many forms. And you have to under, understand and appreciate that back in the, in the mid-30s when, when the law was passed, really the only communication or the prevalent means of communication at the time was just coworkers talking with one another, uh, either on breaks at the workplace or maybe outside of work, uh, among each other, uh, you know, when they were not actually working. Nowadays, communication obviously can occur in a 
extremely wide variety of forms, uh, either in person, on the telephone, through blogs, on social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so the, the, the available means of communication today, given modern technology, is much broader than it was when the law was originally passed. And I believe that's what really has led to a significant amount of dialogue and activity in this area because employers up to a couple of years ago when this area became very popular because of the attention it was drawing were inclined to discipline uh, or take issue with employees talking critically with one another outside of work uh, through technology even if the workers were engaging in these communications at their own personal computer at home um, say in the evening or when they weren't working and the reality is that uh, in order to be concerted activity under Section 7, the only element that you really have to have is the, the communication among the coworkers or the communication by one coworker to management uh, with the authority of others, regardless of uh, which format, form, or vehicle uh, in which that communication occurs. So uh, in addition to being concerted, meaning uh, among coworkers or um, uh, by a coworker on behalf of others, the activity in order to be protected under Section 7 also must be protected. Concerted protected activity is what we're talking about. And in order to be protected, the communication or the, the topic of discussion, if you will, among coworkers needs to involve the areas that are described on your screen, uh, wages, hours, and working conditions. So fundamentally, if non-supervisory employees are communicating with one another for their common good re relating to wages, hours, and working conditions, that communication and that activity is protected under the National Labor Relations Act. And if an employer would try to chill that activity, uh, tries to discipline employees or does discipline employees for engaging in, in that communication about wages, hours, and working conditions, or creates policies or procedures uh, which tend to chill this type of activity, uh, those actions on the part of an employer would constitute an unfair labor practice under the NLRA. So that's the concept of protected concerted activity under Section 7. Um, uh, we've discussed how that can become an unfair labor practice, char uh, unfair labor practice under Section 8, and then how it would be prosecuted as a claim in front of the board. That's really the framework, if you will, uh, for what we're going to continue to discuss today once we get into some examples. Now, the examples I'm going to share with you are all based on actual uh, cases um, and unfair labor practice charges that have been brought in various regions around the country before the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, each one of these, you know, they're posed actually as a hypothetical, but each hypothetical has basis in fact because it's based on an actual case that a that a regional administrative law judge with the National Labor Relations Board actually heard. So these aren't things that we that we created or made up. We decided to actually use real life uh, examples to try to illustrate um, uh, basically what sort of falls uh, behind and across the line when we're talking about what really is protected as protected concerted activity. In this first example, we have an advocate of a nonprofit agency that complained to some coworkers uh, about the fact uh, that uh, she felt third parties, prospective clients of the agency, didn't want to use the agency's services uh, because of certain flaws or problems that this worker perceived in the way that the agency was carrying out its business. And when this advocate expressed these concerns uh, to coworkers, she she targeted one uh, coworker in particular in connection with her criticisms of the, the way in which the agency was conducting its business. Now, this particular coworker, who was really the, the, the target of the, the criticism by the advocate, got onto Facebook uh, after working hours and shared with her friends on Facebook, who happened to be co-workers at the agency, the concerns that were expressed by the advocate, and uh, invited the co-workers on Facebook to enter into a dialogue 
about these concerns relating to the way in which the business or the, the, the nonprofit agency was conducting its business. This dialogue resulted in uh, some discussion among these friends who were co-workers. And when the advocate found out that this was going on online, uh, the advocate complained to management about her perception that she felt that she was being cyberbullied. I've always thought this, this particular case is somewhat ironic in this respect because it's the advocate who started the dialogue to begin with. And then when the dialogue spills over online onto Facebook, the advocate got very defensive and, and, and sort of felt threatened and unfairly treated because of the dialogue that was occurring on Facebook. But the advocate started the dialogue to begin with. Management in this instance actually was sympathetic to the advocate and the advocate's complaints about alleged cyberbullying. And management terminated the, the individual who started the dialogue on Facebook, the, the person who was the target of the advocate's criticism, as well as other individuals who were engaging in this dialogue online uh, with the individual who was targeted by the advocate. And the question became, was the dialogue among the co-workers in this instance on Facebook after working hours uh, about the work-related issues that the advocate had raised protected concerted activity? And in this instance, the board held that it was. Um, this was a dialogue that was occurring among co-workers. It didn't matter that it was occurring on Facebook, and it didn't matter that it was occurring after hours. And it was a dialogue relating to working conditions, work-related issues that had been raised by the advocate. Um, and the fact that the advocate felt that this was cyberbullying really weighed less with the board than the fact that this really was a classic example of protected concerted activity, even though the communications were occurring after work um, in the social media area. And so in this instance, the board found that the terminations um, of each of these individuals who were engaging in this dialogue online was improper. And so this is an example, a fairly clear example, of uh, protected concerted activity and an instance in which the employer actually got it wrong and uh, then was, uh, uh, through the National Labor Relations Board and the administrative law judge, saddled with the remedy, I believe most likely, uh, to reinstate these individuals who had been uh, separated improperly. Other examples are, are somewhat less clear and, and, uh, and more challenging, really, when we look at them. Uh, this next example, once again, is a, uh, a fact pattern that was taken from an actual unfair labor practice charge that was prosecuted before the NLRB, I believe. And it involved a bartender who, in 2010, had a discussion with one of his coworkers about his employee employer's tipping policy. And he complained um, that the tipping policy sucked, and the coworker, uh, she agreed uh, with this particular bartender's assessment of the situation. But neither one of them at the time in 2010, when they engaged in this dialogue, brought their concerns to the attention of management. They were just discussing them between themselves, but never actually took it a step further and, and, and took that complaint and brought it to the attention of supervisory personnel. Next year, the bartender got on Facebook and continued to complain about the tipping policy and, and other issues that he had relating to his job. And some of his remarks, as you can see, are, are paraphrased and in some instances quoted in this slide. And on Facebook, though, when he was doing this, he wasn't engaging in a dialogue, though, with coworkers. He was taking the discussion that he had with the coworker in the previous year and then expanding it on Facebook and ended up in a dialogue with relatives and, and or friends about his concerns at work. And when the employer found out about some of these remarks, which, as you can see from the slide, were, were somewhat harsh, and directed at the, uh, at the establishment's uh, patrons and customers, the employer fired the bartender. And the question then becomes under this example, was the bartender's uh, dialogue on Facebook in this instance protected concerted activity under Section 7 of the NLRA? Now, in this instance, in comparison to the first example we had, the board held that it was not. 
And uh, the analysis that the board went through was fairly straightforward, and if you think about it, makes a lot of sense. The dialogue that this bartender had with a coworker in 2010 may have risen to the level of protected uh, a protected topic, but it really never became concerted, even, even though the two coworkers were discussing it, because it was never brought to management's attention. Then, once that dialogue moved on to Facebook, it didn't involve any coworkers. Uh, it, it involved mostly uh, a, a relative or relatives of the worker. And so once it got to uh, uh, the, the social media platform, it, it lost its protection because the, the communication didn't involve coworkers. It involved other people. And this is an important point. Just because an employee gets online and complains or discusses wages, hours, and working conditions, that in and of itself won't uh, gain protection under the NLRA unless those communications then involve a dialogue with coworkers. A dialogue exclusively with friends or relatives online, even if the dialogue involves uh, wages, hours, and working conditions about an individual's work or, or, or workplace, won't rise to the level or won't take protection uh, unless coworkers get involved in the dialogue online. Let's move on to our third example. In this example, we have an employee at a retail store, and he, he posts comments on Facebook about what he perceives, perceives to be a tyranny at the store. He's very upset. Now, coworkers who are friends of his on Facebook do get involved in the dialogue. And, uh, but what they do is they offer the individual, I guess what we would call emotional support, and ask them, kind of, why are you so worked up? What's going on? And he explains, well, I feel I'm being unfairly criticized by my manager for um, mispricing merchandise, misplace, misplacing merchandise, and I don't like it. Uh, I think it's unfair, and it bothers me. And the, the coworkers who were Facebook friends with this individual respond by saying things like, well, hang in there, hang in there. Note that they don't say things like, we're behind you, or we're going to support you, or we will help you. Um, they're giving more emotional support, um, friend-like support to the individual, as opposed to really engaging in any sort of productive dialogue with them about what to do in connection with his concerns. Management found out about the posts on Facebook, and the employee was suspended and brought an unfair labor practice charge. Does this rise to the level of protected concerted activity under Section 7. In this instance, the board held no, because the board perceived um, what this employee was doing as really expressing individual personal gripes. Um, and once the employee expressed these individual personal gripes, he really didn't garner you know, or obtain from his coworker Facebook friends um, support in the sense that they would uh, that they would suggest that they would help him or work with him with management to solve the problem they supported him emotionally and told him to hang in there so this is an interesting example because I think it illustrates um, a, a line that the board draws based on the facts in 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 any given or particular unfair labor practice uh, charge or case the board will look very carefully at um, the type of dialogue that's, that's being engaged in, who's engaging in it, is it relative friends or coworkers, and then what's the substance of the dialogue online? Uh, are, even if coworkers are engaging in the dialogue, are they offering emotional support to the worker that's complaining, or are they uh, agreeing to help or, or collaborate with the worker in order to try and solve the problem? And depending on how those questions are answered in any given unfair labor practice charge, the result may be, the result may be different uh, when the board hears the charge and decides it. This raises sort of an interesting conceptual point under the National Labor Relations Act, and that is protected concerted activity, uh, individual action versus an individual gripe. The, you have to understand that the NLRB 
interprets concerted activity very broadly. Um, individual action is concerted even if the employee acts with or on the authority of other workers and not solely by and on behalf of the employee himself. Um, but on the other hand, if an employee is just griping about an issue that bothers him or her and it's personal to him or her, um, and, and the coworkers online, for example, are not agreeing to collaborate with the worker, that's not concerted at that point because th there's, there's no agreement to help or promote mutual aid or protection. And in, in those instances, the complaints are personal to the worker and they're not complaints that really involve broader working conditions that would affect more than one individual. But what if an employee starts a dialogue that may not actually rise to the level of formal protected concerted activity, but it's clear that the dialogue is designed to um, initiate group action, or it's the, um, uh, the precursor to what ultimately could become group action. The board looks at these cases fairly critically because the board uh, doesn't want employers to be able to look at a situation, predict that even though it may not rise to the level of formal protected concerted activity in the first instance, but that it may, and then take action to try and preempt uh, the formal concerted protected activity later. Um, this is a good example of, of, of this concept that I'm discussing. In, in this next example, we have um, a supervisor or an employee, rather, expressing dissatisfaction to a supervisor about a transfer. Um, and the employee posted a status update on her Facebook page, and then, using a lot of profanity, was very critical of the employee, stated that, uh, the worker stated that he wasn't going to be a good employee anymore, and the friends, in, the, the friends online on Facebook who happened to be coworkers, setting aside the supervisor for the moment, started to chime in. And they said that we're right behind you. And we're also angry about the same issues that you're describing. And one employee, one coworker who is friends and engaging in the dialogue uh, uh, called for a class action. Now, nothing in, in this particular example shows us that there had been a really uh, a formal action plan developed about the concerns. Uh, the, the coworkers on Facebook who were friends were agreeing with the individual who started the dialogue, indicated that they were right behind the worker and that they would support the worker, but nothing had been formalized yet. Even though a worker referred to the concept of a class action, there was no plan developed in the communication about uh, what the, the co-workers were going to, going to do to resolve the, the problem, um, what, the co what sort of uh, practice or process the employees would engage in in order to address the concerns. But the board in this instance found that this dialogue was uh, what the board sometimes refers to as the seeds of protected concerted activity, meaning it hadn't risen to the formal level yet uh, that you would typically expect when protection attaches. But clearly the communication was designed uh, to start the ball rolling. And uh, the, the, the lesson I think that employers can learn from this example is that when you're evaluating communications that are occurring online uh, among your coworkers, you need to be careful not only to look for classic garden variety communications that constitute protected concerted activity, but you also need to look to see if uh, what you are hearing or reading online could be viewed by the board as the seeds of protected concerted activity. And if you take action to either discourage um, further communications uh, in that dialogue, or if you separate, suspend, or otherwise discipline a worker for engaging in those preliminary discussions, you may find if an unfair labor practice charge is filed that the board will, will favor and side with the workers because the board interprets those types of preliminary dialogues, preliminary communications as protected even though they haven't risen to the level yet of actually perhaps becoming what we would consider classic protected concerted activity in communication. 
the, this, uh, this next slide it kind of covers this concept that I'm talking about. Um, the board looks at these situations and tries to decide if, if what's going on is um, that the, even though there's just a speaker and a listener, uh, our discussions uh, that sometimes are called to the board's attention in unfair labor practice charges, uh, preliminary steps toward um, protected concerted activity. And this uh, uh, slide that we're looking at now actually contains some language that is taken from an NLRB report that was uh, published in 2012. And it's illustrative because I think it explains this concept that we just uh, tried to illustrate through the last example, meaning that um, preliminary communications among workers, even if they haven't got to the formal steps of, of uh, outlining a process or uh, an approach or a game plan uh, to dealing with a, a concern about wages, hours, and working conditions still can be protected uh, even though the communications are preliminary in nature. We've talked a lot about um, the concerted aspect of uh, protected concerted activity, meaning that um, if communications occur among non-supervisory co-workers at private sector employers, uh, or if a worker who has the authority to raise an issue on behalf of a group with management uh, expresses that issue with the support and backing of a larger group of co-workers, that type of activity, that type of communication is concerted, uh, meaning it involves uh, group communication or group action. Uh, but perhaps uh, it, it would be helpful to look a little more closely about what uh, is protected, uh, even if you have that uh, concerted activity core, what actually is protected activity? Because topics of discussion among coworkers, even if it's occurring among coworkers and, and maybe for mutual aid and protection, are not all protected. Um, they have to deal with wages, hours, and working conditions. This slide uh, puts a, a somewhat finer point on the nature of the, the topics that can be covered. The slide talks about wages and hours and working conditions, of course, but um, it, it's a little more expansive in, in that it becomes uh, a little more descriptive. Uh, if an employee or a group of employees are communicating for their mutual aid and protection about safety issues, uh, that clearly would come within this broad uh, definition of wages, hours, and working conditions. If they were communication, communicating about their respective responsibilities in the workplace, uh, about their performance or the performance of others, and this sort of takes us back to the to the advocate and the coworkers in the nonprofit example that we started out with. Um, if they're talking about discipline. Uh, or talking about uh, protesting supervisory actions. All these types of examples of topics that coworkers can discuss and promote or, or address with management are, are good, more descriptive, more specific examples of the types of things uh, that uh, workers can uh, talk about and engage in dialogues about online uh, that will be protected. And one point that's very, uh, I think, important to, to note when we're talking about the topics that can qualify for protection is the, the way in which workers articulate themselves and express themselves and describe things when they're engaging in these types of communications. We've found that uh, in these cases that, that we've studied before the NLRB, that the use of profanity, the use of expletives, uh, the the use of very harsh, critical language or descriptions uh, in the dialogue among the coworkers about topics like this uh, do not necessarily result in the communications losing their protection. Uh, initially, when we when we saw the the, the flurry of, of uh, unfair labor practice charges before the board a few years ago, when when this this whole topic started gaining momentum, we were surprised in, in about the fact that the board would extend protection to communications that were highly critical and involved profanity, expletives, and very harsh language. 
And the board has made it clear in its decisions and its and its reports and its guidance that the the, the use of harsh language or expletives or profanity um, and the 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 significantly critical um, nature of communications among coworkers, if the if the topics involve wages, hours, and working conditions, and the communications are concerted will not bar a worker from taking advantage of the protection of Section 7 under the NLRA. So when you're uh, evaluating whether a particular communication um, qualifies for protection in deciding, for example, whether or not to discipline a, uh, a worker for something that gets said online, don't be lulled into the, um, as an employer, into the view or belief that just because the worker is using very harsh language or the workers in their communication uh, or expletives, profanity, or very uh, critical perspectives, that the communication is not protected. Because in many instances, it still will remain protected despite the critical nature uh, of the communication. Very important point to, to keep in mind. And this kind of segues into the next uh, uh, issue for us, really, which is, well, where is that line drawn, though? When can an employee really lose protection when he or she is engaging uh, online in a dialogue with coworkers about wages, hours, and working conditions? You may be asking yourself, is there no limit? Um, you know, because you've told us that profanity, expletives, critical perspectives, and harsh language won't necessarily undo uh, or... Uh, uh, stop the protection from attaching. Well, there are some, I, I guess, concepts or um, perspectives that you can keep in mind to sort of help you define when an employee may cross the line and when his or her communications with his or her coworkers may lose protection. The, the bar is very high, though, I will say. Um, if communications among coworkers online uh, start to verge or, or land on the cusp of defamation, meaning if a if in a dialogue online, coworkers start personally attacking a supervisor or management, and the the attack uh, appears to be willful or malicious, meaning it really departs from being productive at its core to being something um, uh, much much harsher. Uh, if, for example, uh, workers are communicating about a supervisor or an issue, and they start talking about a co-worker's religious beliefs, or home life, or um, uh, sexual preference in a way that is um, um, disrespectful, or if in the course of the dialogue among co-workers, even if it relates to wages, hours, and working conditions, threats are expressed. Meaning, well, you know, uh, people start postulating or talking about perhaps um, hurting or uh, a coworker or a supervisor or damaging uh, a coworker or supervisor's property. Even though the communications may involve protected topics, and even though those communications may be concerted, meaning that they they're among coworkers, in those instances the communications will lose their protection. And the board has not been bashful uh, about, in those instances, uh, rendering decisions that actually go in the other direction, meaning uh, protection has been lost and the remedy requested by the employee or former employee is denied. Uh, so the message to take away from it is the bar is fairly high. Critical language and profanity alone will, will not result in a loss of protection for these communications. But defamatory statements, willful malicious statements, and threats uh, most often will. And that is probably the best way to conceptualize and draw a line in terms of where protection ends um, uh, or starts and ends uh, as an employer when you're looking at these cases that, that you may be presented with. Uh, let's talk about, in light of everything we've discussed so far, another uh, example. Um, this particular example, once again, drawn from a, a real-life case, involved a car dealership 
uh, that sold high-end vehicles, luxury vehicles. And in this particular instance, the dealership was getting ready to launch a new luxury car model. I believe it was a BMW model. The employer gathered all the salespeople together and talked about how it was going to handle the launch, what it was going to do to market it, how it was going to present uh, the new car model, uh, so that the, the salespeople would be informed about how the, the event that the, that the employer was, was uh, orchestrating and was, and was going to carry out was, was going to proceed. And the, the dealership management explained that it was, uh, was going to get um, food and refreshments, but it indicated that it was mostly going to get these things from um, a warehouse store. And several of the salespeople raised concerns during the meeting uh, about their view that presenting refreshments and food from a warehouse store really was not aligned entirely with the launch of a high-end luxury vehicle model. <laughs> and um, they discussed their frustration among themselves after the meeting. Uh, and uh, they were really concerned that this wasn't the way to present this type of product. They didn't feel as though the uh, management at the dealership was taking the right approach because they thought that the, uh, the, the, the refreshments and the food that management was planning on offering didn't rise to the level of the, the event um, and didn't really carry the, the, the or, or wasn't going to promote the right atmosphere for the launch of this particular car. So the event occurs and uh, you have salespeople taking pictures at the, taking photographs at the event and once the event concluded, one of the salespeople posted a photograph or a number of photographs actually online with some commentary. And it was satirical commentary. The, the employee, the salesperson, once again criticized management, criticized the event, saying he was really happy to see that the employer had gone all out for the important car launch by providing small bags of chips, inexpensive cookies from a warehouse club, semi-fresh fruit, and a hot dog cart where clients could get overcooked hot dogs and stale buns. Um, and when management uh, got wind of the post, it disciplined the, uh, the worker. And the idea here, I guess, or the concept that this presents is, is complaining about an event like this, uh, in light of the fact that this, that this concern and viewpoint grew out of a discussion among coworkers after the preliminary meeting before the event occurred, really does this rise to the level of protected concerted activity? This individual, I think, clearly was expressing the views of the group. Um, this was not an individual gripe. Uh, the group, from their dialogue after the preliminary meeting, clearly agreed, the consensus was, that the way the, the dealership was handling the event wasn't appropriate. And this is simply just a, a post-event expression of those views. But um, is this really a, a, a description or a commentary on wages, hours, and working conditions? Um, the board ultimately found that it was. And the board's reasoning focused on the fact that these salespeople who were offended by the way the event was presented and who had expressed uh, concerns about what was offered in terms of food and refreshments at the event were commissioned salespeople. And uh, this, I think, took on some particular significance for the board because the board uh, concluded that if the event was presented in the wrong way, if the, the concerns that the uh, salespeople expressed were valid, these concerns in terms of the way this model was presented and, and the way the management handled it could impact their compensation. Uh, because if the event was not presented in a way that was consistent with the product that the dealership was offering, a high-end luxury vehicle, maybe some of the, the, the prospective customers who showed up and um, uh, you know were given uh, sort of substandard food and refreshment items 
may be somewhat less impressed than had this been this event been catered in a different way, and then that could have translated into a a loss of commissions for some more you know one or more of these individuals. That's how the board really reasoned um, its conclusion in finding in favor of the um, employees in this particular example. Uh, interestingly enough, as a postscript to that example. Um, uh, at the event, and this is not in a slide, but I'll share this with you, with you because it, it sort of takes the illustration to its logical extreme. Uh, in addition to snapping photographs of the of the food and refreshments and posting the critical comments about the way the event was was catered, if you will, um, a uh, an, an, an interesting uh, an, an, an additional event occurred at the launch that was somewhat unfortunate. Um, a uh, uh, a prospective customer who showed up at the event allowed his son to sit behind the wheel of a vehicle. And uh, the, the brake got in dis disengaged on the vehicle, and the vehicle actually ended up rolling uh, down a hill and, and uh, uh, stopping and sustaining some damage. And the, uh, one of the workers took photographs of this incident and posted them online with some um, satirical commentary. And when that individual who was disciplined filed uh, his individual unfair labor practice charge, the board actually found in favor of the employer um, because the, the board concluded that the, the incident was serious and making light of the fact that a customer had uh, an accident in a, vehicle, in a vehicle that could have been somewhat dangerous was really not uh, a proper topic of discussion online. It, it was embarrassing and was not really constructive. Interestingly, I think if, if in connection with posting those photographs, that salesperson had commented about the, the dealership's safety procedures and raised questions about why and how that accident was permitted to occur, the result may have been different. But Posting photographs online about a customer having an accident in a vehicle on the property and then making light of it didn't rise to that level uh, that the board thought was constructive enough to become protected. Uh, an interesting postscript to um, a somewhat colorful uh, example. So to kind of summarize what we've covered, um, protected concerted activity really, as we said uh, toward the beginning, is broken down into two components. It has to be concerted, meaning that it involves communications or activities among two or more non-management, non-supervisory employees, um, or preliminary discussions like that that are designed to uh, initiate uh, group action. And either that dialogue has to occur among coworkers, or a coworker needs to be speaking to management, acting on behalf of or for the benefit of a group, um, and not just expressing an individual gripe. That type of communications, uh, those types of commu communications are concerted. In order to be protected, the communications really need to deal with the terms and conditions of uh, employment, wages, hours, working conditions, safety concerns, responsibilities, things of that nature that we covered in, in greater detail a little bit ago. And finally, um, an employee or group, a group of employees will not lose uh, protection in their communications uh, just because a dialogue is critical, because it is laced with profanity or expletives, or is is uh, fairly harsh. The, the communication must sort of step over the line into a communication that is defamatory, willful, malicious, or involves things like threats against co-workers or supervisors in order for the communication to lose its protection. Um, if communication or activity among coworkers satisfies the definition of protected concerted activity under Section 7 of the NLRA. A worker can then bring an unfair labor practice charge under Section 8 of the NLRA in front of the National Labor Relations Board, which will uh, uh, conduct a hearing, hear testimony, review exhibits, and has the authority to uh, impose a number of remedies on behalf of the uh, worker or, or fo former worker if the board, the administrative law judge, finds that the unfair labor practice charge was valid. 
Um, when we move into the next segment after the break, Lori uh, is going to uh, discuss what an employer can do in situations like this to avoid the risks that we've described in this first section. Um, she'll talk uh, about a number of things, but she is going to discuss uh, the way in which employers can create uh, solid uh, policies that the board will not conclude violate or chill uh, activity under the National Labor Relations Act. Um, she also will discuss, as we talked about at the beginning, uh, issues relating to ownership of social media platforms, accounts, friends, and followers, so that you can understand a little better um, for those workers who you charge with the responsibility of promoting your business online, uh, what the limits are in terms of how you can preserve uh, your ownership rights in those platforms and followers and friends, and, and how you can reduce your risk for a dispute when an employee leaves um, in, in the event an employee is promoting your business online. So that concludes my segment of the presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And after a brief break, Lori Higuera will join you to talk about the additional issues that we'll cover in the presentation today. Thank you very much. Hi there. My name is Lori Higuera. And with John Belitis, who you just heard from, the two of us co-chair Fedemore Craig's Employment and Labor Practice Group. I'm going to take off where John ended, and that is, given all of this activity surrounding protected activity and the legal ramifications if an employer gets it wrong, what is an employer to do in order to protect itself? This is a perfect slide for that. I dare you to fire me for what I said about you on Facebook. What is an employer to do? Well, there are several things an employer can do. And the first begins with being proactive. Instead of reacting to a situation, put it out there for all of your employees to know in a handbook, in a separate policy. Let them know what the policy is. And in that sense, it's important to know that a policy m will violate Section 8 of the National Labor Relations Act if, in fact, it explicitly restricts protected activities. So a perfect example of that is if in an employee handbook you see a prohibition against all employees talking about their wages or their salaries. Well, wages and salaries certainly can be a term and condition of employment. And so to prohibit all employees from talking about that certainly would be an explicit restriction against engaging in protected activities. But a policy may not be so obvious. There may be a policy that seems written well on its face, but in effect still violates Section 8 if it would have the tendency to chill employees from engaging in protected activity. That is, if it's written in a way that could be interpreted by an employee um, in a reasonable manner to prohibit them from engaging in protected activity. Or if the rule was promulgated in response to union activity and this was the employer's response, that also may be a sign that this perhaps is a policy that's too broad and a violation of the act. The last, of course, if the rule has been applied in order to restrict the exercise of Section 7 rights. So when you have a policy, it's not enough just to have a policy that addresses it. It's, it's important to have a policy that is well-worded and avoids some of these outliers. We can't go over all of the language that is considered too broad, but the board has put out several guidance memos talking about different employer policies, what the board likes about it and what the board doesn't like about it. And what the board typically tends to do is point to language that it perceives as being too broad. Why? because it can be misinterpreted or interpreted by an employee as overly broad in a way that would prohibit that employee from engaging in protected activity. Here are a few examples on this slide. A prohibition against posting pictures in any media that depict the employer. Certainly we can all imagine circumstances where that would be perfectly appropriate. For example, a medical, a doctor's office where there are patients in the background that would be a reasonable basis to prohibit this type of activity. 
But there may be other situations where there isn't a legitimate business reason to prohibit this type of activity. So that's it. It's not enough just to copy language that we see in one handbook into your particular business's handbook. You have to make sure that, in fact, it applies to your business situation. Appropriate and inappropriate discussions. Well, that's somewhat of a subjective situation. In, in, to prohibit somebody from engaging in inappropriate discussions may mean one thing to employee A, but something different to employee B. And that, again, opens up for interpretation the possibility that an employee may perceive that as prohibiting him or her from engaging in protected concerted activity. So if you go down this list here, you'll see a number of examples that because the word can be interpreted in different ways and doesn't have sufficient qualification or clarification, can be construed as too broad by the board. I would encourage you to go through your handbooks, go through your policies, and review them to make sure that they are not also subject to this type of overbroad interpretation. And if they are, find a way to clarify them with language that's helpful in terms of detailing the type of circumstances that you're referring to, or perhaps providing an example of the type of conduct that you are um, intending to prohibit as a way of adding clarification and narrowing the type of prohi prohibition to what is specific and what is not a violation of the act. So here are your action items. Number one, as we've already talked about, review your current policies. Make sure that they are focused on the type of conduct that you're prohibiting, and make sure that you're not prohibiting conduct that would be considered protected concerted activity under the National Labor Relations Act. You're going to also want to review all policies, if, even if they're not in the handbook, and that would include your social media policies, because it's those policies that can have a good intent, but again, be construed too broadly. To the extent that you find language in your handbook and your policies that's too broad, then go back and see how you can narrow that, whether it's by your choice of words, clarifying, or adding details. It's also never a bad idea to add a well-written savings clause. In other words, some sort of clause that says um, none of these prohibitions are intended to prevent or prohibit employees from engaging in protected concerted activity as interpreted under the National Labor Relations Act. That's not going to be a guaranteed save, but that will certainly add to the protection that you're trying to get as an employer. And the last, of course, is to, protect, to proactively address the ownership of social media accounts through policies and written agreements and act promptly upon the termination of an employee. That's something that I'd like to get a little more into now with our next topic, Let's talk about that, emerging issues. Although social media has been around for over 10 years now, a number of different social networking sites have come up in popularity, some more than others. The law hasn't quite caught up to the social media activity, especially when it enters into the workplace. And because so much of what we do is in that gray area, in other words, it's a personal social media site, but perhaps we talk about work or work-related items. Perhaps we use our social media site to promote our employer's business. We start to blur the lines between what is personal and what is professional. And it's that blurry gray area that has been sort of, if you will, the venue for a number of emerging issues to come up. That's where I want to spend a little bit of time with you for the next few minutes. Those issues tend to be over who owns these accounts, who owns the passwords, the usernames, the Facebook friends, the Twitter followers, the LinkedIn connections, when you're talking about this very large gray area. And right now, the law has not come out and answered that question for us. But we do have a number of cases that help shed some light 
in terms of spotting the issues and hopefully being proactive with policies and handbooks and actions to avoid or at least mitigate those issues from becoming legal problems in the workplace. <clears throat> Let's start with LinkedIn in terms of who owns your LinkedIn account. We know that LinkedIn is a social networking site for professionals. Last year at least it had about 240 million users over 200 countries. So you can see that a number of professionals are using LinkedIn in order to promote themselves personally but also professionally and also promote in some instances their employer. This has been an area that I'm talking about, this gray area. The current case that probably demonstrates the issues that come up with LinkedIn best is a case called Eagle versus Edcom. In this case, Linda Eagle was the president of Edcom, which was a banking education company. And Edcom was acquired by another business. Shortly after the acquisition, Linda Eagle was terminated. Now prior to her termination, she had shared the password to her LinkedIn account with another employee of Edcom for the purpose of allowing that employee to update and change the profile of her LinkedIn account. After she was terminated, Edcom still had her password and used her password to go into her LinkedIn profile and change her name and her photo with that of her successor. In addition, some of the awards and honors on her profile remained, but they appeared to be the awards and honors not of Linda Eagle, but of her successor. Miss Eagle filed a lawsuit in Pennsylvania federal court against the company alleging that they had violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Lantham Act, and several state claims for misappropriation of identity. The court dismissed the federal claims but pursued the state claims. And last year, in March 2013, the court ruled in Ms. Eagle's favor. They found in her favor on unauthorized use of name invasion of privacy, and misappropriation of publicity. In ruling, the court noted several things. They noted that Ms. Eagle had a privacy interest in her name, in her resume, and in her photo. It, the court also noted that her name had benefits to it. It had benefits of reputation, of prestige, and of commercial value, at least in the industry of banking education. And the court also found it significant that a third party searching for Eagle on LinkedIn would be led not to Eagle, but to her successor. So the court found in favor of legal on all of these issues, but that had some limits because in the end, her victory was hollow. The court did not award Ms. Eagle any damages because it found that her damages claim was too speculative. In order to try and establish her damages, Ms. Eagle said that each contact, and she had 4,000 contacts on her LinkedIn account, was worth about 250 a year for a total of a million dollars over a year. But the court found that her calculation was too speculative and that it lacked corroborating evidence. And as a result, even though she prevailed on the claims, she ultimately walked away with no monetary award. Edcom, in this very same lawsuit, also brought counterclaims against Ms. Mrs. Eagle. And Edcom claimed that Miss Eagle also was responsible for misappropriating Edcom's property. Edcom claimed its property was the LinkedIn account. And even though the court rejected Edcom's claim, it's interesting to read the court's ruling 
because the court found that, in fact, EDCOM did encourage its employees to create and to use a LinkedIn account, but the court went on to say that there was no real proof that this LinkedIn account was the property of EDCOM. Why? Because EDCOM did not have a policy that uh, required employees to have a LinkedIn account. EDCOM did not dictate what information employees put in their LinkedIn profile. And EDCOM didn't pay for any LinkedIn account. And so as a result, that claim was denied by the court. It's interesting though, the case is over, but it shows you the issues that can arise in this type of situation. Let's talk about another related situation. Twitter. Who owns your Twitter followers? The case that's probably most talked about in this area is a case called Phone Dog versus Noah Kravitz. Phone Dog uh, is a mobile device and app review site, and Noah Kravitz went to work for the company and he opened up a Twitter account and he gave himself the handle um, at phone dog underscore Noah. Now while Noah Kravitz was working there, he amassed um, a number of Twitter followers, about 17,000 followers. When he went to quit, resigned from phone dog, he took his Twitter account with him and he changed the handle. He changed the handle from at phone dog underscore Noah to at Noah Kravitz. Phone dog, as you can imagine, did not like this because in addition to taking his followers with him and changing the handle, Noah eventually went on to work for a competitor and began to use those Twitter followers in order to promote the business of the competitor. So phone dog then sued Noah Kravitz, alleging misappropriation of trade secrets. Phone dog's basic argument was, listen, the password to the Twitter account is a trade secret, and those followers are, at least for our business, the same as a client list, which is also a trade secret. And by not relinquishing the password and those followers, Noah Kravitz, in effect, was misappropriating phone dog's property, phone dog's trade secret. <laughs> Noah Kravitz asked for the court to dismiss those claims by phone dog, and the court declined to do so. The court felt that in Twitter accounts, Twitter passwords may be considered trade secrets, and the court also found that an employee's failure to relinquish that password and those followers may constitute a misuse of trade secrets. So you're probably wondering what happened, and I can't tell you because ultimately in December of 2012, that case settled under undisclosed terms. Now what I can tell you at least is as part of that settlement, Noah Kravitz was able to maintain his Twitter followers, which at the beginning of the lawsuit had been about 17,000 and today is more than 22,000 followers. Again, this opens up the question and it lets you understand a little more the issues that can arise in this very gray area when an employee is using social media that can be perceived as both personal and professional to promote the employer's business. There is another case on Twitter accounts and who owns your Twitter account, and that is the case of Jill Merrimont versus Susan Fredman Design Group. In this case, Jill Merrimont used her personal Facebook and Twitter account in order to promote the business of her employer. But eventually, at one point, um, unfortunately, Ms. Merrimont got into an accident and she went to the hospital and she was there for some time. While she was there, her employer was able to get her password and then start posting on her Twitter account as if it was Ms. Merrimont. Ms. Merrimont found out about this and she asked them to stop 
And according to Ms. Miramont, it didn't stop. They continued to post on her Twitter account. Ms. Miramont didn't like this for a number of reasons, one being of which she felt that her followers wouldn't understand the seriousness of her injury and her accident, that they would think she was back to work. So Ms. Miramont sued her company in federal court in Illinois. And she sued them for many of the same claims that we've talked about here under the Equal Clays case, the Lantham Act, and misappropriation of her identity, publicity. The court looked at that, and there was a discussion about whether or not summary judgment was appropriate. The employer sought to have her claims dismissed, and the court rejected that effort. The court felt that the employer's use of Ms. Miramont's Twitter account was sufficient to allege a false endorsement claim under the Lanham Act. So that case, again, still leaves open the idea of who owns these accounts, who owns these passwords, when we're talking about social media. So although we don't have any clear direction from the law or the courts in terms of what one can or cannot do to ensure their property interests are protected, we do have a lot of takeaways in this situation. The first is, much like we talked about in the first session, and that is written agreements. <clears throat> it is important up front if an employee is going to be using a social media account, be it Twitter, be it LinkedIn, be it Facebook, to promote the business of the employer, that there be an agreement up front as to who owns those accounts, who owns the passwords. Also, that agreement should cover access. Who is able to access that? Who is able to have those passwords and change those passwords, whether it be upon request or certain circumstances, such as that of Ms. Merrimont, where she was um, unable because she was in the hospital. It also should address what happens with those accounts and those passwords, the followers, the contacts, if and when that employee separates from the company. Who then owns those accounts? Who gets to take them? And if you have that type of an agreement up front when everybody is getting along well, the likelihood that there will be a smooth transition once that employee leaves is much higher and much better. So written agreement is always the best thing to do to make sure everybody's on the same page. Policies are also a, a nice thing to do. Policies can be either a, a standalone policy or in an employee handbook. Again, talking about much of the same things, clarifying who owns social media accounts, whether it's the employees or the employer, and talking about what sort of content is appropriate on these accounts, especially when they're promoting the employer's business. You want to talk about what sort of content on a social media account would be appropriate. You also want to clarify who has access rights. Is it just the employee? Is it a group of employees? Is it an employee and an alternate in the event that the employee is not able to go into the account for whatever reason? And then who has access when the employee leaves, for whatever reason, the employment of the employer? You need to spell those out. Now, if and when an employee does leave, even though you've got a written agreement and you have policies, there are still protections to take. An employer should send a reminder to the employee reminding him or her of the policy or of the agreements just to ensure that there's no misunderstanding and everybody's clear on what's expected. The employer should be certain to collect the username and the password in order to ensure that the employer then can provide that to whichever employee then will be tasked or charged with updating that social media site. And the employer probably should consider changing the password so that there's no confusion down the road as to who has access to this despite the fact that the employee has now left. <clears throat> I next want to transition into our final topic for today and that is social media hiring. 
social media sites, as we've talked about, are extremely popular, and you can get just a wealth of information from social media websites, whether it's somebody you're interested in dating, somebody that you're going to meet at a professional networking event and would like to learn a little bit more about. For whatever reason, social media sites are a good first to free step to go to in order to gather more information about an event, a company, a person. And it's no different for employers who are considering job applicants. Most employers use some form of social media to recruit. But what about to filter out or to eliminate job candidates from the job pool? Well, according to a survey last year in 2013, a survey by CareerBuilder, two in five employers use social media research in order to help inform their decisions about job candidates. And of that two in five, 43% of those employers actually used some of the information that they were able to gather from social media to make a hiring decision about the job applicants. This sounds like a great idea, and in fact, in many cases, it probably is a good idea. If you look here, um, these are some ex excerpts from Gene Marks, who blogged a little bit about his use of social media when considering whether or not to hire particular candidates. <clears throat> At the time that this blog was written, Mr. Marks was a business owner, and so he was providing the perspective of a business owner saying, I am an employer, and if you want to work for me, I want to see what you're up to on Facebook. Also saying, I have to consider the welfare of my existing employees. I can't bring someone into the company who is disruptive or abusive or just not a good fit. A simple interview doesn't suffice. Checking references is never enough. A resume doesn't tell me everything I need to know. If Facebook helps me determine that a prospective employee may be offensive to others in my office, I want to know that. This is a person who will be representing my company to my customers, suppliers, and partners. Who I hire says a lot about me and my company. Now again, these are just excerpts from the blog, but I think they suffice to show us why and how employers use social media information to make informed decisions about people that they're going to bring into their workplace and hopefully have a long professional relationship with. Like Mr. Marks, many employers want more information about the people that they're considering hiring, about the people that they're considering bringing onto their team and introducing to their customers and clients, about the people that they're going to be relying upon to help promote and grow their business. And while generally more information is a plus when we're making a decision, employers who use social media information to make hiring decisions should be aware and should appreciate that there are limits to when social media information is helpful and not harmful. And specifically what I mean by that is on social media sites, we can learn much information about job candidates as well as employees. Information that wouldn't otherwise be available on a resume or an application. And in particular, information that would be considered protected category or classification information under the law. Some examples of that is while it may not be um, transparent on one's resume or application, on a social media site, an employer may find out that a particular applicant is pregnant, uh, may find out about that applicant's marital, marital status, may find out genetic information about that applicant if they're talking about somebody in their family going through some form of cancer treatment may find out that that applicant has a disability that isn't otherwise visible at an interview. So there's much information that can be gathered through a social media site 
that would be considered protected category information and would be considered inappropriate and a violation of certain federal and state laws if that information was used in order to make a hiring decision. <clears throat> in that sense, using social media sites to make decisions can sometimes expose employers to claims of discrimination and other misconduct in the area of hiring. So what do we do? Certainly I'm not saying we shouldn't and cannot use this, but what I am saying is, yes, this information can be helpful, but it has limits, and we just need to appreciate those limits and um, conduct ourselves accordingly. We need to be cautious and aware. Um, the first thing is, be aware of what those protected classification information categories are and make sure that we're not using that in the hiring process as part of our decision making. The best way to do this probably, um, and, and I should say the most cost efficient, is to use a buffer. In other words, the person who is going to play a role in whether or not an individual is hired should not be the same one who is researching social media sites about this candidate. That should be a completely separate person so that the person who is exposed potentially to protected information about a person can filter out the inappropriate information before passing on all of the appropriate information to the decision makers. That's certainly one precaution to take, and if, like I said, a cost-efficient precaution to take. Um, the other precaution is to be aware. This is a very, like I said, gray area, but also a dicey area. There are um, a number of conversations going on throughout the country as to whether or not it is appropriate for employers to require or ask applicants or employees for their usernames, for their passwords to social uh, media sites so that the employer can go in and conduct this sort of research. They are up to this point over 10, probably about 11 to 12 states that have passed laws prohibiting an employer from either asking or requiring applicants or employees to provide this sort of username or password information. This year, in 2012, there are over 10 states that are introducing similar legislation in order to have similar prohibitions enacted. So to the extent that an employer is going to ask or require that sort of information, that employer is well advised to understand what the law in its state is before it takes that sort of step. If an employer is going to have a third party, I talked a little bit earlier about a buffer, I was referring to a buffer within the company, but if an employer chooses to have a buffer, a third party, conduct this sort of social media research on an applicant, then an employer needs to be aware that doing so may implicate another federal law called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, when a third party conducts a background check on an applicant or an employee, certain requirements and obligations are implicated. Employees or candidates need to be notified that this is going to be done. They need to provide written consent. And if certain hiring decisions or other decisions are based on that information that is gathered, another type of very specific notice needs to go out to that individual. So again, if an employer chooses to farm out this task to a third party not within the company, the employer needs to be aware that other laws may be implicated and the employer will need to make sure that it's complying with those other laws in order to ensure a cautious route pathway to that. <clears throat> All of this, of course, is to say, yes, more information can be and typically is a good thing when we're making very important decisions about who we hire and who we bring into our companies. But like with 
many situations, there are limits. And what that means is employers need to be aware of what those limits are and make sure that they follow this process in a way that is not going to violate any laws or create any unnecessary litigation for that employer and its potential employee or actual employee. So of course this would not be any worthwhile social media webcast if we didn't also tell you how to contact us on social media. Please consider visiting our Facebook page and liking us, following us on Twitter, and watching us on YouTube. We frequently provide updates in less than five minutes on specific legal developments and place those on YouTube. I want to thank you so much for your attention and your time today on this very important issue. I'm sure we'll be back next year. As I said, it's an emerging issue with lots of gray areas, and hopefully over the next year we'll get some clarity on at least a few of these issues. Thank you so much.